essentially, today I'm going to talk to you about honey, a sweet and sticky story. Uh, I've introduced my wife, Mandy. Uh, Mandy basically runs the honey business, um, the, the RMP and the risk management program, uh, and I do the, the stuff in the field more. Um, this is our two children, Amelia and Hugh. Amelia's uh, 12 and Hugh's 9. Got them right, Phew. Uh, and we farm on a 7,000 hectare uh, high country station called Island Hills at the head of the Balmoral Forest. Um, it's, as you can see from, we go over the top of that range, uh, there's, you know, a lot of it's mu pretty marginal, um, which spurred us to look at other, with, with th only 3,500 stock units uh, when we came home. And so it look, made us look at other options. Uh, we started a three night walking track, which we ran for 10 years and uh, then a honey business uh, on the property. And um, we st when we started the, honey, uh, the walking track, we, we basically opened in October and went through to April every year, so we were stuck on the farm uh, all that time. We, could never, we couldn't go away together at all. And in 2012, we won the Balanced Farm Environment Awards for Canterbury Region, and that meant that we got forced, I guess, to leave the farm in some, some periods. Uh, when, we, when we got off the farm, uh, there were some people that thought we were a bunch of greenies because we had this walking track business, and those that didn't think we were greenies thought that we were a bunch of hippies because we farmed insects. Uh, but the reality is that we were just farming for necessity. We wanted to be sheep and beef farmers, and we were currently living in the shearer's quarters with long drops and ice in the, in the sink on a frosty morning. Uh, so our passion is about being sheep and beef farmers or farmers um, at Island Hills. Uh, we love the farm and we were just really wanting to find ways of being able to make it work. And, um, you know, with farm succession not being uh, the way that often people think it is, we needed to generate more in income. But I'm not here to talk about that today. What I'd like to talk to you about or is to give you the questions to ask. And not just the questions to ask yourself, but the questions to ask beekeepers so that you understand what's going on on your farms. Uh, because it's really important to understand it because there's a lot of talk around it at the moment and a lot of it's sort of uh, misconceptions, some of it good and some of it bad. Uh, I'll start with uh, the basics of, of a beehive, uh, then talk a little bit about types of honey, uh, and then a little bit more specifically around manuka honey, uh, a little talk around location of apiaries and why we, or why they should or shouldn't be positioned in certain places, and then that'll that'll end up with uh, what are the questions to ask. So the basics of what is a beehive. Uh, when I first looked at getting into doing beekeeping, uh, I looked at beehives. I went round our farm and I counted them up, and I thought that every box here was a honey box, uh, and the reality is it's not. Uh, each of these stacks is called a hive, but within a hive you have components. You have at the bottom the base, you have a brood chamber which is where the queen lives and lays her eggs. Then you have uh, a queen excluder which stops the queen going up into the uh, honey boxes and then the lid on the top. And so there's, a, there's an exception to this as some beekeepers decide that they want to run two queen hives so they may have brood chamber queen excluder, brood chamber, queen excluder, and then the honey boxes on top. Uh, it's, you know, some think it's the, the way to do it, to be more efficient. Um, but I'll come back to that later because there's a reason why you need to know that potentially on your farm. So a queen excluder, this is just an example where the bees can go, th the, the worker bees can go through the queen excluder, but the queen can't, so you don't get your, uh, you, can, you can harvest your honey without it being contaminated with uh, uh, brood. And here's an example of what a couple of two queen hives may look like. They, they norm, they're normally higher because they've got that double brood chamber and they also need to allow for more honey boxes because they're stronger because of, for that reason. Uh, and what you'll also notice here is you can now see, uh, you'll see that a wooden layer about two boxes up. Uh, that can be plastic as well, but that's essentially the queen excluder which stops that queen coming up. So you can look around at, your, at the hives that you've got on, on your property and you'll now be able to see where the honey boxes are and where the queen, queen lives. Uh, just on the bees that are in the hive, uh, so we've got 
On the, the far side, the left side, we've got the worker, uh, all females, uh, without sexual reproduction. Uh, they do all of the work, just like in our house. <laughs> uh, and then you've got the queen in the middle. Now, the queen, uh, essentially to make a queen, is th they feed it royal jelly when it's at an egg or larva stage, and that gives her the ability to develop sexual organs. Uh, and so there's one of them or maybe two in a hive if a, if a beekeeper decides to manipulate that into a two-queen hive. And then you've got the drone on the right, the male. Uh, he does one job and he does it well. Uh, and then when he's done it in the, in the autumn, uh, the, the females actually banish him from the hive and he starves to death outside. So uh, that's, he's gone each year. The, now, the, the, the difference in how long these last, like, for example, a worker bee will last, it, it's sort of like a helicopter. It's got 2,000 hours. Once it's done its hours, it, it's, it needs to be rebuilt. Well, a, a bees are the same. The worker bees in the summer will last only six weeks and collect about a teaspoon of honey, uh, but in the winter they'll last a lot longer, uh, and the queen could last two years because she'll only do two flights for, for mating and then she's, she's in the hive. So um, that's the, the bees in there. Uh, and you can see why the queen can't get through the excluder. She's quite a bit bigger and the, and the drone's the same. So we'll move on to the types of honey. Now I've simplified, simplified this somewhat, but there's essentially four types of honey. Uh, monofloral honey, multifloral honey, polyfloral, and dew. Now the difference is uh, monofloral is essentially comes from one nectar source, so one flower nectar source. Uh, multi from just a few, but still identified uh, sources, and then polyfloral is essentially everything that they can find. Uh, where, you know, so at certain times of the year, they might they, they got access to a lot of different uh, nectar sources or even honeydew. And dew at the bottom, which is a very is very different because it's the secretion of a mite that lives in the bark of a tree, and then the the bees collect it. So the significance of that is that it's actually got no pollen in it. So it doesn't crystallise, so it will stay runny forever. Um, but that, that, that's the other type that we have in New Zealand. There's, there's other countries that can produce that as well. So uh, if we move on to manuka honey, uh, the, the first thing that you need to understand, because this is where a lot of the talk has been um, in recent times, is the first thing you need to do is understand the difference between manuka and kanuka. Uh, it's, re it's re reasonably simple once you know, but manuka it starts with M, it's massive, so everything about a manuka tree is bigger. It's got a bigger seed, it's got bigger leaf and a bigger flower. Um, you'll also notice from the pictures that the, the flowers are all individual flowers on a manuka tree. And so when you see them uh, you know, in the field, you'll notice that there's actually, you know, they're more, more evenly distributed over a whole, whole bush, whereas kanuka are all in these bunches and you can't really distinguish the individual uh, flowers. So that's how you can tell the difference because, you know, and, and the significance of that is that actually a lot of people think, oh, you know, I've got this gully full of um, manuka and actually there's not really a lot of manuka in there at all. It's predominantly kanuka. Um, and so what that's done over the last few years as well is that uh, a lot of kanuka, because if you look at them under a microscope, the pollen under a microscope, they look identical. So they haven't been able to f establish a way of, of differentiating between these two honeys, which has meant that uh, they've all been essentially sold as manuka honey. And uh, there, there lied the problem, was that we were producing more manuka honey than what we were as a country. We were selling more manuka honey than we were producing as a country. This led to MPI uh, looking for markers in the honey that they could use to identify the difference between manuka honey and, and other honeys. Uh, they spent a number of years doing it, and they may not have necessarily got it perfect yet, but it's a good start. And they've c come up with these four chemical markers in the honey uh, and a DNA test, excuse me, so that they can, you, you can identify what is actually manuka honey. And that will give, if, if it meets one of these two these two criteria here, you're allowed to put the word manuka on the label, uh, either monofloral manuka being a higher grade manuka or multifloral manuka. 
And the reason I said before that it's debatable they got it right, uh, you know, having looked at our test results, there's a little bit that falls into multifloral that sh potentially shouldn't, and there's some that falls out of it that maybe should. So, you know, they have already changed this once, and I think that as they understand uh, what the, the correlations and the relationships are, they will tweak it a little bit, um, but that's only, um, you know, how I, how I see it at the moment. Um, but this, this has given us a good base for an understanding or, or, or long jeopardy in our industry because we now know what is manuka and what isn't. Um, and so what makes manuka different? Well, if, if we just start with honey in general for a start, uh, honey, you know, if you put it on a dressing or a burn, um, the significance of honey is that it, it um, has what's called peroxide activity, which is the same as what you use for your hair, for um, well, some people do. Uh, I may have once, <laughs> in my wisdom, when I was young. Uh, and uh, th so it has peroxide activity. It also, uh, unlike a sugar, which if you put water with it and you leave it, it, the water will evaporate and the sugar will be left behind, honey actually absorbs moisture. So it will suck the moisture away from a wound uh, and, you know, so that essentially no, no bacteria can grow without that. So that's why it's been used as a preservative uh, for thousands of years. But the difference with manuka honey is that it's also got this antibacterial activity. Uh, and the way that they used to measure that was that they would essentially get a tea tree dish full of bacteria and then they would put a drop in it and they would see how far away from that drop it would kill the bacteria. And this is what became known as the UMF or the unique manuka factor. Uh, UMF is actually a brand though, so it's, a, it's an owned brand, and they wouldn't, they didn't really disclose what the formula was for coming up with their UMF number. And so that led to a number of other people coming up with their own, you know, s slightly differentiated use of the test and their own activity uh, rating, and that confused everybody. So one scientist actually identified the compound in the honey that uh, gave it its activity, and that's uh, MGO or methyl glyoxal. And so now you'll see that some manuka honeys have the labelling with MGO written on it, uh, you know, so, a, as the compound. And you know that's just a, a factual number. So that can be directly correlated to an, a UMF number or an MPA, a non-peroxide activity number. So that's becoming more common. Uh, so that's. That's the basis of manuka. So, so one of the other little things is that there's actually a little bit of multi, so the lower grade honey that's coming up quite active. So that's one of the things that, that we're going to have to grapple with uh, around the test results. So the, uh, the next thing to move on to is uh, just is around hive locations. So uh, this has been, you know, this has become more of an issue as the honey industry has risen and as it's moved from being more of a niche industry to sort of a corporatized industry uh, you know, with larger numbers, and the pressure's gone on. I guess when there's money in it, then um, you know, it, the industry changes significantly. But the first thing you need to really understand is the difference between wintering or collecting honey. So there's a number of sites that are used for wintering hives that don't necessarily collect any honey. Um, and they're just used because of maybe good access in the winter or they may have an early pollen source, but uh, then the hives are moved away. Um, and the reason for that is that you, know, that you need to understand that because uh, beekeepers may be moving hives away you know, f before or they may be just wintering hives on your place, yeah, moving them away before the, the honey flow happens. Uh, the other thing is that directly relates to how far away the hives are from the boundary because for wintering, it's not as big an issue, but for obviously honey collecting, um, you want to consider how far away they are from your boundary because otherwise, it's not really dissimilar to grazing the, the, your stock in the neighbour's paddock um, or vice versa. Uh, so th th there is some exceptions to that where the only sites available or the best sites available are actually near a boundary and then you, you've got to think about whether you can work with the neighbour or um, the beekeeper can you know, work with you both to ensure that the, um, the honey is distributed relative to where that site sits. 
Um, but this has been a major issue in the North Island and it's uh, becoming more of an issue in the South Island now. And you know, when we got into beekeeping, um, the last thing that we ever dreamt of that, uh, you know, that we would you know, be thinking about someone you know, trying to harvest the honey on our farm or that that was gonna be an issue. And so now, I guess, you know, a lot of farmers don't understand the relationship between where the hives are and, and the honey that's collected. And so if they do, you know, because it can cause neighbourly um, relationships to break down as well. So it's really important to understand that. <clears throat> so I'll just move on to the questions. Now, firstly, it's the questions that you need to ask yourself, because um, often in, uh, I have had consultants, for example, uh, say to farmers, they say, oh, you know, I've heard this farmer's getting X number of dollars um, for, for his place, so, you know, you should be trying to get the same. And the reality is that every property is different, even if they are right next to each other. And so the first question is, where do I sit on the spectrum of pay or paid? So I've just came up with this, you know, sort of way of looking at it. Uh, there's some places that pay us to have beehives on their places. Uh, this is crop pollination, so we do uh, Chinese cabbage, bok choy, carrots, um, a number of them, um, and they, they, we're paid for that. And the reason we're paid is because uh, that happens during the honey flow, so we don't get any honey. You often have to do a number of moves at specific times with small amounts of hives, and uh, you, you, so you're essentially at attending to them a lot more and you don't get a lot of profit out of, you know, th there's often no honey. Sometimes there's a little bit, but there's often none. Uh, so you get paid for that and then you move up the scale. So from, you know, this is how I look at it. There'll be other beekeepers that would potentially look at this differently, but, you know, crop, uh, clover crop pollination, there might be, a, a, you know, quite a lot of honey. Uh, you know, then you move up to honeydew. And at some point on the scale, it moves from, from the farmer paying to being paid. And in the middle, there's a little bit of this neutral ground where essentially if you're in the back blocks and you, you still need your clover pollinated, that you want a beekeeper there. And so if, you're, if you, you, know, you want to know where you sit on the scale. So if we look at those que uh, questions again, um, what do you need to think about? You need to think about what flowers are flowering on my farm and when and timing of that. Do I have good access to that? Uh, uh, what safety aspects should I be concerned about? Because you know, I think this has been one that's been relatively overlooked uh, around you know what risk this has. Um, there's been a number of incidents happen um, over the years, but uh, you know this has become a bigger issue for us. We need to know when people are on or off our farms. So thinking about that, uh, how trustworthy is my beekeeper? Now, depending on the situation that you're in, uh, this is a this is a big a big issue. Be I mean, if you're being if you're getting a payment per hive then it's not, as, it's not as big an issue. But if you're getting a percentage of the crop, then you need to really know that you can trust your beekeeper. And in addition to that, um, you know, that they've got good ways of, of working out um, what they're collecting from where. Um, what, are the, what are the hive numbers that you should expect? I think this is another one um, you know, where you, you may not necessarily understand what, what's the right number, and you've heard of, of people having large numbers of hives, or it may be that the person, the beekeeper, isn't actually stocking your your property as they should be, um, and they're essentially just holding it and not utilising it to the, its full, which means you're not getting the potential benefits of that. And then, where in relation to my boundaries should they be? So this is about thinking about you know how you're going to affect your neighbour, um, or how your neighbour's going to affect you. Um, and then you look look go on to the beekeeper questions. Uh, how many hives do they winter on on your property? You know, this is this was one of the things that really actually uh, you know got us into this. Uh, so the, the first reason why we moved out of just our own farm was that you can't just have one geographic location sustainably, because if you have a honey flow on one farm and it fails, you've basically got no honey. It's not like when you have lambing and then you you've got a poor lamb to sell. You actually can often have you know, nothing to sell. Um, and we've, we had that really er early on on our property when we first started. And so that led us to look at having multiple geographic locations. Um, so, you know, that, that was a big thing. But the, the, the thing that we then noticed was that there was a number of farms that went, well, 
Well, the beekeeper takes all my hives off the place uh, at this time, which is when the when the clover's flowering, because they're moving them, trying to move them to the manuka sites, and they're not leaving any behind for, for pollinating the farmer. So they're selling it to the farmers essentially as though we're doing a job for you pollinating, but then they're moving them away before they're doing the pollination job. Uh, so I think that that was a that was a big that was a big deal. Um, so. No, you may not need as many as they winter there, but you will need some for pollinating if you've got clover as well. Um, uh, what's uh, the minimum amount? So just thinking about, or just getting them to justify why the amount that they've got on your property is the correct amount. Um, you know, some people talk about a, a one hive per flowering hectare. Uh, this can and can't be true depending on, you know, we've, We've had years where the weather is not right and you can have quite good flowering and not a lot of honey, and other years where there's not that good a hunt, uh, flowering and you can get a lot of honey. So um, it's a bit one per, hec per flowering hectare is what's considered a sort of an average. Um, how much do they produce per hive normally? So the, you know, the, the average for the country is around 32 kilos, so understanding what the amount that they produce will one, give you an indication of what they're like potentially, or also you can then benchmark that or ask your neighbours and see what they're, they're producing so you get an understanding of whether that's relative to the area or not. Uh, single or double brood chambers, the reason why this is significant is because if you're being paid per hive, right, then they're essentially running two hives in one in some ways. So, I mean, if they're paying you a good amount per hive, then a double brood chamber is fine. But if you're getting a percentage of the crop, then uh, then it's not such a big deal whether they're running single or double brood chambers. But, you know, that's, that's an, it's something that's become more of an issue, you know, and you see people getting, a, you know, a, an amount per hive and then you've got these massive stacks with double brood chambers. Um, what type of honey is it that, that they're actually producing? What is the MGO or activity of it? Is it, is it active or, you know, is it, you know, just understanding? Do, is there anyone in here that, actually, you know, gets a report from their beekeeper on the activity or the understanding of their honey? One, two, couple, yep. Because uh, that at least gives you a, the ability to have a conversation with them around you know, what, what's in it for you. Uh, the information about the honey and are they willing to provide it? Because there's some that just aren't and I think if that's the case you need to really consider whether you've got the right person there or not because it should be pretty transparent. And what systems do they have for their records? Uh, and you know, this, is, this has come about by the fact that there's been a number that have uh, said to us that you know, they got X amount and you, you're pretty sure that that wasn't, you know, it's just they've averaged it over all the properties that they've got. And you know, farmers, as farmers you need to uh, get rewarded for quality like we want to in the red meat sector. So um, you, know, you, you need to be getting rewarded for the honey or the, the honey that comes off your property. Um, that's basically Basically, I wanted to leave this reasonably short because there has been an, a lot of discussion in the media or a lot of discussion even amongst farmers about uh, what's going on. So I wanted to, uh, you know, essentially can answer anything about that. Um, one thing, Mandy was just going to talk about the RMP because one of the things in this is that it's not actually, it's not all beer and Skittles or whatever they say. Uh, it's, actually, it's actually been really tricky and we've come across some quite big challenges. Uh, Essentially, though, when, when Dad said to me, oh, you know, just get, because he had some hives when he was a bit younger, he said, oh, just get four hives. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, and then went out and bought 400. Um, it was a bit of a shock to the system. So, yeah, we got some learnings. But one of the things that, one of the things is running a risk management program. So to, in order to sell your honey or for the honey to be sold offshore, which is where uh, the value is, you have to run an RMP or a food grade facility. And you know, Mandy does all of that herself, um, and it's a major challenge. Uh, and the rules keep changing weekly, I think. So um, I just thought Mandy was just going to talk a couple of things about running an RMP and what's involved in that. So there's quite a lot involved in running the RMP. It's definitely not the easiest job in the world. Um, there's a lot of paperwork involved, which is, uh, for me, something that I don't enjoy much at all, but it has to be done, um, and in most businesses um, that's the case. Um, so everything needs to be recorded, um, and that starts when the honey boxes come into the shed. 
Um, you need to know what property it came off, what apiary on that property it came off. Um, you need to know, um, obviously, the date of the harvest date. Um, and the MAF ID, that MAF ID, every, every APRI site has a MAF ID number, and so that has to be um, recorded as well. Um, during the extraction season, every drum needs to be labelled correctly and, and recorded. So basically, um, you ne need to be able to trace that drum back to, um, back to, the, to the property that it came from. Um, every year we have two audits. It used to just be one audit, but now it's two. Um, so, so all of that stuff I just talked about is um, you, they, um, they um, is checked twice a year, and so you really, really have to make sure that your paperwork's um, up to scratch. Otherwise, they um, they get you on that one. Um, so it's uh, just like it's not as easy as putting um, some hives to, on a property and collecting the honey. There's a lot more, a lot more involved in it. So um, yeah. So that's my role. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so one thing on that, because of that level of traceability, uh, that, that's why it should be really easy for them to report back to you what they've, what they've done. Um, and so that, that should make it really easy. Uh, in addition to this, this, this has, is becoming easier, but on both the livestock and, um, and beehive, you know, everything that we talked about earlier, that spurred us to actually, because of my background, is we've started the software company which does traceability for livestock and for, for beekeeping. So th that was because if we're going to prove and have trustworthy systems, that we need to be able to do that. So when you looked in the wee buyer that we do that, you know, it wasn't that I came home and wanted to start a software business. It was because I really saw that that was the only way that we were going to be able to reach the high premium markets was actually if we went down that path and actually had robust systems for proving that we're doing. So we can look up, I could look up any APRI site that I've got right now and tell you the date, the harvest date, what was done, what health treatments were done, um, what drums they're in, what batches they're in, and where they are sitting at the moment. So I could do any of that with, with our honey right now and, you know, we, it, it, I, well, I mean, I can do it with my livestock as well now, as well. So um, that's it from that side of things.